So today's class, we're going to be discussing Gregorian chant. Uh, Gregorian chant is one of the names we give to the chant of the Roman Catholic Church. It can also be called plain song or plain chant. So any of those terms are used interchangeably to describe the chant of the Roman Catholic Church. Plain song, plain chant, or Gregorian chant. Gregorian chant is named for um, Pope St. Gregory the Great. Uh, he was, he lived in the 6th century, so that would be the 500s. He was from a wealthy Roman senatorial family, and he also founded several monasteries in Sicily, as well as St. Andrew's Monastery in Rome. Early in his life, he was sent to Constantinople as an envoy, and of course Constantinople was the other capital of the Roman Empire. Uh, by this time, Rome was falling in decline, so Constantinople, Constantinople was the more important uh, city. Gregory the Great is credited with establishing the musical tradition of the Western Church, and you can see in this image here that I'm going to put up, uh, this image of St. Gregory the Great, uh, you can see him dressed in the robes and the, the accoutrement of a pope. He's got the hat on, he's got the um, the different robes and things and stoles on as well. In the picture you see this uh, bird, which represents the Holy Spirit, uh, whispering into Gregory's ear. And then Gregory is directing the scribes which are around him to write down the music which the Holy Spirit is giving him. So it shows this kind of direct connection to um, from Gregory, from God, to Gregory to the scribes, to what we have the music of today. We know that this, of course, this is uh, not factual, um, because one of the reasons is the first repertories of Gregorian chant, or plain song, uh, did not come to be written down until the 9th century. And, as I mentioned, Gregory uh, lived in the 6th century. So what is chant? Well, Let's start by asking, what kind of chants do you know? Do you know any Gregorian chant? Some of you may say, I have no idea <laughs> what Gregorian chants, but I think you probably know this melody here. This is from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and which this is often sung during the season leading up to Christmas. So this is an Advent song, but even today you'll hear this being sung in shopping malls and things as people go about their business buying their Christmas presents. Sounds like this. Oh, come, oh, come, This is what we would call a Gregorian uh, hymn, but it is Gregorian chant. So this next one, I want you to kind of sing with it, okay? This is a Gregorian chant. This is the from the Kyrie. I want you to sing it. I know you're by yourself probably right now, um, but I want you to give it a shot. So don't worry about whether or not it's perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I want you to try to kind of fit into the sound of the choir as it responds. So the cantor is going to sing Kyrie eleison, then Christe eleison, and then Kyrie eleison. You remember this is the Greek um, text from the beginning of the Mass. It's the first ordinary of the Mass. So the cantor is going to sing something, and then the choir is going to sing. And I want you to try to sing along with the choir even humming, but I really want you to give it a shot. All right, here we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
different. Try it. So it's not important that you sound perfect when you sing Gregorian chant. It's not important that you sing louder than anybody else. As a matter of fact, it's better if you don't sing louder. So if you didn't sing or you felt a little weird doing it, go back and do it again. Try it again. Because when you go on the field studies, I really want you to be participating with your voice, not just observing. I want you to try and sing the music because only then will you know, is it too difficult? Can this be done? Um, does it make sense? So if you didn't do it that time, go back, rewind, and sing the Kyrie again. Turn up the volume if you have to so you don't have to hear yourself sing. All right. So there are six characteristics of Gregorian chant. It's liturgical, so it only exists within, within the context of the Roman Catholic Church. It's vocal. It's sung. There's no instruments with it. It's monophonic. We're going to cover that in a little bit. It's unaccompanied, meaning there's no instruments to go along with it. Um, some people say a cappella, which is an Italian phrase, which means in the style of the chapel. So a cappella, no instruments. It's also rhythmically supple. The reason for this, very, very important to, 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 to know this, it's because the rhythm of the music is determined by the rhythm of the texts being sung. That is the most important thing. Not the melody uh, of the music, but the rhythm of the texts which are being sung. And it's modal. So there's a unique scale structure. And let's talk about modal, what modality means more in depth here. So there are these different modes. There's eight modes, and that's all you really need to know. But I'm laying it out here for you, the different types of modes that they have, and they have each have different scales. It's very different from today's major and minor scales, which you would hear. In today's world, you'd hear a major scale like this. This is C major. La, 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 la. Right? That probably sounds familiar. Or a minor key, which would sound something like this. Major and minor scales, which we use today, um, have major scales usually have kind of a happier feeling, and minor scales usually have a more of a melancholy feeling. Well, modality, this modality is different from that. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you some of the, um, the different scales that we have within modality. It is one of the most distinctive features of Gregorian chant. So here's the Dorian mode, which is the first one listed. La, 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 la. There's really no beginning or ending to it, where in the major and minor modality, you, it definitely feels like there's a, a beginning point, it builds tension, and it, and it rests. So listen to the, um, to the major scale again. That's a major scale. La, 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 la. You see that last note leads to that final note, right? It feels like it rests there. Listen to the major uh, mode again, or the major key again. La, 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 la. You can't end there. It really, it really wants to go down. La, right? So the modes don't have that kind of feeling to it. So now I'm going to play for you the Phrygian mode.
very different feeling from the major and minor modality. So I just want you to know that the sound is very different from what we would have experienced today with the major minor uh, keys. But the thing to take away from modality is the distinctive sound that it has and the fact that there are eight modes. So let's talk about monophonic chant, monophony. What is monophony? Well, it comes from the Greek, uh, where there, first of all, there's a large, very large repertory of uh, monophonic chants within the Catholic Church. It follows the year long um, cycle of readings uh, that was existent before uh, the Second Vatican Council. As we discussed before, when we talked about the liturgical year, we said that there were three cycles of readings. Um, before the Vatican II, there's only one cycle of reading. And so the Gregorian chants uh, followed that year-long cycle of readings. And they were mostly transmitted um, orally. So a um, singer would learn from another singer. And there's uh, various organization of pitches, as I mentioned, the different modes that you have, um, and the arrangement of rhythms. Monophony comes from the Greek word, uh, two Greek words, so mono meaning one, um, like a monk or a monastery where um, monks live by themselves. They have their own little cell. Uh, if you think of uh, when somebody gets ill and they've got mono, it's a, you know, a single-celled uh, organism which is causing them to get sick. Um, so it comes from the Greek mono and then the word for sound, which is phony. So mono, phony, monophony, as we say in English. So one sound will come upon uh, music pretty quickly that is polyphonic, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so knowing that Gregorian chant is monophonic, it's one voice uh, or one melodic line being sung together. So let's talk about some questions from the readings that you had. Do you like that transition? What types of chants existed prior to the rise of Gregorian chant? There were about five different types. The Beneventan chant from your reading, you can see that, that's in southern Italy. The Roman chant from Rome and the surrounding areas of Rome. The Milanese chant, um, which is most often called Ambrosian. Uh, because St. Ambrose was from Milan. So you can, it's either one, Milanese or Ambrosian. And then you have the Hispanic or Mozarabic chant from around uh, the Pyrenees, uh, lower France and Spain. And you also have several Gallican chants from, uh, from France. And of course that Gallican comes from the word uh, the Romans used for France, which they called Gaul. Um, so that's how it gets its name. So we've got Beneventan from southern Italy, Roman, Ambrosian or Milanese from Milan, northern Italy. We have Hispanic or Mozarabic chant from around the Pyrenees, lower France and Spain. And then you have Gallican chants from France, or as we call Roman Gaul. What role did politics play in unifying the liturgical practice in the Middle Ages? I think this is a very important um, point to make. That politics plays an important role in unifying liturgical practice. It plays an important... Usually you'll find that religion and politics will go hand in hand um, to unify a people. Um, you can see this throughout European history, but you can also see it in uh, the spread of Islam. And uh, when you have a ruler who believes one thing, he wants or she would want uh, their people to believe the same thing. It unifies people. And in this instance, we have, um, there's in the readings, it talked about Pepin the Short. And the effort by Pepin or Pepin and his son Charlemagne to unite all of uh, Europe. And the way to do this is through 
similar liturgical practice. If we're all doing the same thing, they're all people are becoming Christians now throughout, you know, as a reason to unify um, the, the European continent. Unifying liturgical practices will help to ensure political stability for the rulers. Next question. What made the acceptance of the new chant easier for the different styles of chant and liturgy? Well, there's a couple of reasons for this, right? As you read in your readings. Um, partly, we needed a system to write down the melodies of the songs. How do we, can we write these down so that other people in other towns who can't get their singers there to transmit orally, how will they learn the new, the new tunes, the new melodies? The other um, thing that made the acceptance of the new chant easier was attributing that to Pope St. Gregory, who we talked about at the beginning of the class. If you've got some really important figure and you say, well, he invented it, or it's it comes from uh, Pope Gregory the Great, and you can go back three centuries, then people in that contemporary time might think, well, yeah, that makes sense. If it was good enough for him, it's good enough for us. So that's one of the things. So writing down the music is important. It's a very significant point, turning point in the history of music as well. And attributing it to some uh, person in the past uh, who carries some kind of weight. So let's talk about uh, now this man, Guido D'Arezzo, who's one of our first most important people that we're going to be studying in this class. Guido D'Arezzo was from Italy, as you might imagine with a name like that. Guido is a great guy. Um, he is very, very important in the history of Western musical tradition. Really, for all world music, he's very important because he invents a couple of things. So let's take a look at Guido. This is our first star of music. Guido was a music theorist uh, from the early medieval era. He's regarded as the inventor of modern musical notation. And we're going to take a look at that in just a bit. He was a monk. He was a Benedictine monk. And he lived in the Italian city-state of Arezzo. Which makes sense. Guido of Arezzo. Guido d'Arezzo. Um, he noted the difficulty that singers had in remembering the Gregorian chants. So he came up with a met method for teaching the singers to learn chants in a short time. And quickly became famous throughout all of North Italy. So, what did he do? Well, before Guido d'Arezzo invents this musical system of writing, we have what's called these early neumes. And these neumes were um, essentially shorthand for remembering the melodies, and this is what they looked like. So you had the words of, this, of, the, of the prayer or the song there, uh, in this instance. And then above that, people would write these little, what we call neumes now, that we, they would write these little reminders of how the melody was to be sung. As you can imagine, there's no real guide to go on here. And you have um, what essentially look like scribbles and you go down and up and over. It's, it's not very clear. So, Char um, excuse me, Guido comes up with a way to fix that. And so these are the later neumes that Guido then invents. He invents the staff. And here you can see in this image, there's four line staff, which are in the red there. And then you can see these square note neumes. And now it's essentially like you've got a graph above the words that tell you exactly the melody. And this is why Guido, one of the reasons why Guido is so important in helping um, modern musical notation. There's another reason that he's important. So this is very significant, the written down melodic lines that we have here. 
but he's also important for another reason, because he invents a way to sing different scales. I'll give you an example. Oh. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. When you read, you begin with A, B, C. When you sing, you begin with Do, Re, Mi. Do, Re, Mi. Do, Re, Mi. The first three notes just happen to be Do, Re, Mi. Do, Re, Mi. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti. Oh, let's see if I can make it easier. Do, a deer, a female deer, Ray, a drop of golden sun. Me, a name I call myself, Far, a long, long way to run. <laughs> so, a needle pulling thread, La, a note to follow so. <laughs> Tea, a drink with jam and bread, That will bring us back to All right. So, uh, as you can imagine, uh, where, where, or maybe you haven't even thought of it, where does do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do come from? Well, it comes from Guido d'Arezzo. While he was at Arezzo, he developed a new, technolo uh, new technologies for singing, such as the staff, which we saw, but he also invented what we call solfeggio. And he invented it using this chant called Ut Queant Laxis. Because what he realized is that in this simple chant, Ut Queant Laxis, Resonare Fibris, Mira Questorum, <laughs> Gestorum, whatever. If you see there the bolded um, words, Ut, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, that formed the scale, and he was like, oh, this would be a great way to teach the singers how to sing the music. And so he used the first syllables, so we replaced, in modern times, we replaced ut with do. So, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la. And then a couple hundred years later, we get ti, do. <laughs> and this comes from him. So let's listen to this chant. Utre fa re mi re 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 utre mi 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 fa so mi re mi utre fa so la so fa re re 
sola, sola, mi fa soli, la sola, fa sola, la sola, mi de ut mi. revolution brought about by an unassuming 11th century monk by the name of Guido. This is the Museo della Musica in Tala, Italy, which houses displays on the history of music as far back as the musical notation system developed by Guido around a thousand years ago. Until the 9th century, Music was transmitted almost exclusively through an oral tradition. Manuscripts like this one contained shorthand reminders placed over the words to show the general contour of the melody. But unless the singer already knew the chant, they weren't much help. The simple brilliance of Guido's system was to add lines and a clef, which identified a note on that line as F. You'll notice from this manuscript that there were only four lines instead of the five we have in modern notation. And rhythmic durations were still undeveloped, but the ability to specify pitch was a quantum leap for music. Another important contribution made by Guido was to name the first six tones of the major mode so that he could easily make reference to each pitch while teaching the chant repertory to his students. He took the names from the first syllable of each line in this hymn, because each line outlines the next step in the scale. Ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la. The Guidonian hand bears Guido's name, and it is a great application of his ideas but he probably didn't actually create it. At least, it's not mentioned in his books. The concept behind the hand was that once a singer memorized the positions of the syllables, a teacher could teach a whole group of monks a chant melody by pointing to the pitches on his hand. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, and la are still used as solemnization symbols in music schools today. So, if you're wondering who to thank for the soul-fed syllables you use in musicianship, Guido's your man. Soul-fed, combined with the ability to write down and recreate chant melodies, was a musical revolution, or what Howard Goodall calls a big bang. Go! Go! go. It's rolling! It's 1730. Okay, so um, that should finish our class for today. Next, we're going to be discussing the musical and textual relationships of Gregorian chant. Um, see you guys then.